is a great occasion, one to celebrate a Supreme Court decision that changed our country. I want to tell you at the start that I listened to some of the discussions this afternoon at the University of San Diego. I found it absolutely fascinating. Uh, I thought it was really beautifully done, thoughtful and informed. Um, my talk tonight will not be about the details of what some have called, fairly enough, the failure of Brown against Board of Education to make the kind of changes in our <coughs> educational system that um, we might like. It will be rather what, about what Alan Burson said this afternoon, the fact that, uh, that Brown against Board of Education provided a platform for the end of American apartheid. The case was decided on May 17, 1954. Fifty years later, its reverberations go on. It's all over America this week and next. People will be discussing what the decision has done. There will be disagreement, which is only natural on a subject as profound as the question of race in American life. The Brown decision has meant different things at different times. When it came down from the court, it was a lightning bolt that we thought, or I should more accurately say that I and people like me thought, would transform the chemistry of our schools. Then it was a symbol of conflict, the court embattled a whole region of our country resisting its judgment. Then it was the catalyst for fundamental political change. And now, now somewhat surprisingly, it is the focus of fierce intellectual controversy. Voices are heard to argue that it was all a great mistake, that the decision has not had a positive effect on American race relations that later courts did not or perhaps could not make it meaningful, that its promise was betrayed. I want to tell you at the start my answer to the question, what has Brown against Board of Education wrought? I found that answer a few months ago when I was visiting the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. I found it in the person of a second year law student named Michelle Stamps. Michelle Stamps is the president of a student organization called the Media, Entertainment, and Sports Law Association. She invited me to talk about the failures of the American press in reporting what has happened to civil liberties in this country since the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. When I got there, I discovered that Ms. Stamps is African American. She was born and brought up in what used to be the heartland of American racism, Jackson, Mississippi. But she shows not a trace of concern about the color of her skin. She told me she first thought about becoming a lawyer as a child so she could fight discrimination, religious discrimination. She is a Seventh-day Adventist, and she was concerned about denial of the right to worship, not work, on Saturdays. She knows about the struggle against racial discrimination. She has read about the civil rights movement, but for her it is history. Michelle Stamps is something I could not have imagined 50 years ago. A black young woman from Mississippi, unmarked by racial discrimination. There were great women in Mississippi in the segregated past. Those of you of a certain age may remember Fannie Lou Hamer. Hamer who said she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And she stood up to President Lyndon Johnson to fight the all-white Mississippi delegation at the 1964 Democratic National Convention. But Michelle Stamps is something else. She is free. She went to a public school that was nearly all black. So what she represents is not a triumph of integration. What she demonstrates is that even though racial lines still divide much of American public education and American society, 
the ideals proclaimed by Brown against Board of Education, the ideals of freedom and equality, have had a profound effect. No one can pretend that the fears and prejudices of racism are gone from our country 50 years after Brown, but it is a different country in its attitudes towards race. When I first went to Washington as a newspaper reporter in 1952, schools were segregated. In the capital of the country, African Americans could not eat at drugstore lunch counters or sit with whites in movie theaters. Thurgood Marshall could not attend the University of Maryland Law School. In 1954, the law in 17 southern and border states commanded or explicitly permitted racial segregation in public schools. In the Deep South, the dominant theme of politics and culture was keeping the Negro in his place. Black Americans were kept from voting by fraud force, even murder. They were relegated to separate and, and unequal public facilities of all kinds, from hospitals to cemeteries, from cradle to grave. Racism has deep roots in America. When Thomas Jefferson, George, I thought you were going to steal my line when you mentioned Jefferson. When Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence, he owned more than 100 slaves. Slavery was, in fact, the mainstay of his existence. He had been a real estate lawyer doing dull work when he inherited his father-in-law's property, including 100 slaves. And that enabled him to become a gentleman farmer with interests in architecture, wine, and the philosophy of freedom. And yet somewhere inside Jefferson, there was a knowledge of evil. In his original draft of the Declaration of Independence, he condemned George III in passionate language for bringing Africans to America as slaves. That passage was struck out before final passage of the Declaration. From the beginning, there was another strain of thought in this country, one that saw the servitude of a people because of their race as inconsistent with American ideals. And in the earliest days, at least one court took seriously a Constitution's promise of freedom and equality. That was the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, newly established when in 1783, 1783, it heard the case of Quack Walker. Walker was a slave. Massachusetts had slavery then. He had been promised his freedom when he turned 25. When he did not get it from a new owner, Nathaniel Jennison, he ran away. Jennison found Walker, beat him, and brought him back. Jennison was prosecuted for assault and battery. His defense was that slavery was established in Massachusetts, and his property rights entitled him to seize and punish a runaway. Massachusetts had a new constitution, drafted by John Adams in 1780, while the Revolutionary War, War was still going on. And by the way, that Constitution is still in force with amendments. The Supreme Judicial Court then was composed of five conservative gentlemen. But they were all aware of the new Constitution, which, as Chief Justice William Cushing put it, sets off declaring that all men are born free and equal, and that every subject is entitled to liberty. Cushing said that, by the Constitution's language, I quote, slavery is in my judgment as effectively abolished as it can be. With that, slavery ended in Massachusetts. As you know, the federal Constitution did not follow the Massachusetts model on freedom. The framers, framers accepted recognition of slavery as the only way to win ratification. Over the next 60 years, much of the American political struggle was over Southern efforts to maintain slavery and expand it into new territories. In 1857, the forces of slavery won what they thought was a decisive victory in the Supreme Court, the Dred Scott decision. Chief Justice Roger B. Taney wrote for the majority that Negroes could not be citizens of the United States. At the time of the Revolution, he said, Negroes were deemed to be, quote, beings of an inferior order, 
and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect." Close quote. Dred Scott was described 100 years later by, well, 80 years later by Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes as one of the Supreme Court's self-inflicted wounds. It helped to bring on the Civil War and then was overruled by the 14th Amendment, which starts off by saying that all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens. For a brief period after the Civil War, Congress and the country were committed to the welfare of the former slaves. But soon, Northern politicians lost interest in the cause of justice for black Americans. The Republican Party, which dominated the presidency for decades, was chiefly interested in making the country safe for industry. And the Supreme Court's interpretation of the 14th Amendment and its promise of justice for the former slaves changed as political attitudes did. In 1896, the Supreme Court put its certificate of legitimacy on the idea that Americans with dark skins could be kept separate from whites. In Plessy against Ferguson, it approved the doctrine of separate but equal facilities for Negroes. Homer Plessy, objecting to a Louisiana law requiring that Negroes ride in separate railroad cars, said the effect of the law was to label them as inferior. But the court rejected the argument. Its fallacy, Justice Henry Brown said, was the assumption that the enforced separation of the two races stamps the colored race with a badge of inferiority. If this be so, it is not by reason of anything found in the act, but solely because the colored race chooses to put that construction upon it. How cynical that sounds today. We live after the Nazis made Jews wear a yellow star, and we can have no doubt that the intention of Jim Crow laws was to stamp blacks with a badge of inferiority. It hardly needs to be said that the doctrine of separate but equal anointed in Plessy against Ferguson was mocked by reality in the American South. Black schools and other public facilities were grossly unequal. The injustice of black life was not just in schools, hardly. Life generally was burdensome and dangerous as the lone dissenter in Plessy, Justice John Marshall Harlan, had predicted. Legalizing separate facilities, he said, would stimulate aggressions more or less brutal and irritating upon the admitted rights of colored citizens. Brutal indeed. By the end of the 19th century, more than 100 black Americans were being lynched every year. I've taken you through that unhappy history because America is a country with little historical memory, the land of forgetting. But if we are to understand the issue of race in our society, we have to remember, we have to face the reality, past and present, of racism. Many years ago, I was visiting South Africa, apartheid South Africa, when I found myself seated on a plane next to an Anglican bishop. We talked, and he said to me that white South Africans suffered from existential blindness. I asked him what he meant. He explained that in order to exist, to live untroubled lives, white South Africans had to blind themselves to the cruelties imposed on South Africans of a different skin color. The bishop was right, and not only about South Africa. Jefferson understood the true nature of slavery. In his notes on the state of Virginia, he wrote about its devastating effects on slave and master. When I reflect that God is just, he wrote, I tremble for my country. But he closed his mind to those realities in order to live as he wished. In a sense, what has happened to the United States since 1954 has been an exercise in ending existential blindness in persuading Americans to see the reality of racism. Ironically, 
Southern resistance to, this, to the decision in its violence and lawlessness helped to open the country's eyes. I imagine that not many Americans today are aware of the scope of that resistance. Southern governors swore to close schools rather than desegregate them, and some did. In 1956, more than 100 Southern members of the House and Senate signed what was called a manifesto condemning the Supreme Court for abuse of power. As late as 1960, six years after the decision, not a single black child attended a public school with whites in Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, or South Carolina, or attended a state university in those states with white students. Only 4% of black citizens of voting age were registered to vote in Mississippi, 14% in Alabama. On their television sets in 1957, Americans saw white people outside Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, shouting at a handful of black children, niggers, keep away from our school, go back to the jungle. We saw riots in Little Rock and New Orleans over school desegregation orders of federal courts. Professor Alexander Bickel of the Yale Law School wrote a little later, compulsory segregation like the Southern way of life, is an abstraction and to a good many people a neutral or sympathetic one. These riots, which were brought instantly, dramatically, and literally home to the American people, showed what it means concretely. Here were grown men and women furiously con confronting their enemy. Two, three, a half dozen scrubbed, starched, scared and incredibly brave black children. The moral bankruptcy, the shame of the thing, was evident. But it was not only the character of Southern resistance that changed national opinion, it was the way black Americans in the South were inspired by the Brown decision to demand justice. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. The strategy that came to be called direct action was born. The black people of Montgomery carried out a bus boycott with amazing determination, yielding neither to threats nor to exhaustion. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. arose from that bus boycott as a new kind of leader. He spoke of following Gandhi's nonviolent protest as a strategy. For both Gandhi and Dr. King, protests were a way of reaching the conscience of the oppressor. Might be added that the oppressor has to have a conscience for the strategy to work. Hitler would not have been moved by protest. The idea of awakening the national conscience worked in good part again because Southern segregationists overplayed their hand so crudely. National journalists startled readers and viewers by simply recording what happened. One of my treasured examples is a piece by the great Southern regional correspondent of the New York Times, Claude Sitton, written from Sasser, Georgia, on July 26, 1962. 38 blacks and two whites were holding a voter registration rally in the Mount Olive Baptist Church. Sheriff Z.T. Matthews told Sitton, I tell you, Captain, were a little fed up with this registration business. As his deputy walked around the church holding a revolver, Sheriff Matthews asked the crowd, can you vote if you are qualified? The crowd replied, no. Do you need people to come down and tell you what to do? Yes. Haven't you been getting along well for a hundred years? No. The civil rights movement succeeded by showing racism for what it was. When they saw it bare, Americans did not like it. They pressed Congress to act, and Congress did. In the civil rights legislation of 1964 and 1965, it enlisted the federal government definitively on the side of equal rights. At last, after many failed attempts, it guaranteed black Americans in the South the right to vote. They voted and they changed the political landscape. <laughs>
The result was not to create a desegregated paradise in the South. <coughs> Most whites shifted to the Republican Party, and it came to dominate the region. But Southern blacks were now treated with political respect. They ran for office, and they were elected. Ralph McGill was a great editor of the Atlanta Constitution. He fought against racial discrimination when that was a lonely and sometimes dangerous position. Some years after the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, a friend stopped by McGill's office in Atlanta and said he wanted to show McGill something. They walked to a hall where there was a meeting of black elected officials from the South. It was a large hall full of people. Ralph McGill, Ralph McGill stood in the back of the hall and tears ran down his face. Ladies and gentlemen, our country is still marked by the legacy of racism. I hardly need to say that. Richard Kluger wrote the leading book on the Brown case, Simple Justice. In a new edition, he has added a postscript. In it, he tells about what happened a few years ago to the president of Brown University, Ruth Simmons, who happens to be black. She was shopping in New York at Saks Fifth Avenue when she noticed that she was being watched by security people. The incident brought an apology by Sachs. A television interviewer asked Ms. Simmons whether she still felt victimized by racism. She replied, every day. Of course, embarrassment to a prominent individual is the least of the problem. One quarter of the 36 million black Americans are officially ranked as living below the poverty line. Blacks make up an underclass in the centers of major American cities. Most of them go to inferior schools. To be born black in this country is still to start with an enormous handicap. The continuing failures of our society on the issue of race have led a few black radicals to dismiss Brown against Board of Education as a false promise or even a mistake. And some conservatives are attacking the Brown decision today in rhetoric as vicious as anything the Southern segregationists said, or so I believe. Thomas Sowell, a right-wing intellectual, had an op-ed piece in today's Wall Street Journal that charged the decision in Brown against Board of Education with responsibility for rising crime and many other evils. <coughs> I thought the only thing he left out of his parade of ho horribles was global warming. <laughs> Disappointment with where we are on race 50 years after the Brown decision is totally understandable. But I emphatically disagree with those who suggest that there really has been no change in attitudes on race because of what the Supreme Court decided. I think, excuse me, I think there has been a revolution. 50 years ago, when the comedian Eddie Cantor put his arm around Sammy Davis Jr. on a television show, hate mail inundated the sponsor of the program. African Americans appeared in movies only as shiftless, happy-go-lucky beings. No black man or woman headed a major corporation or university. Merely to mention those realities of the recent past is to know how different things are today. We have a black Secretary of State. A black man, hence the Time Warner Company. Black business executives and Oscar winners are numerous. There is a substantial black middle and upper middle class. The real significance of the Brown case, in my terms, not about schools, but about the country, was well caught by John Romer of Parkton, Maryland, who as a young man took part in the sit-ins protesting discrimination at restaurants and other places of public accommodation. In a letter in this week's issue of The New Yorker, Romer said, Brown told us that the law was at last on the side of racial equality and gave us an absolute sense of confidence. We would win because segregation was now both wrong and illegal. Ultimately, the government, history, and American values were on our side. Because of Brown, the American flag was ours, close quote. And as a footnote, I can tell you that 
the sit-in case that went to the Supreme Court from Maryland, the lead case, the case was called <coughs> Bell against Maryland, was about a Maryland student named Robert Mac Bell. Today, Robert Bell is the chief judge of the highest court of Maryland. Yes, this remains a race-conscious country. A terrible legacy of slavery, two centuries and more of slavery, has not been dispelled. Racism exists, and I am sure many distinguished black Americans encounter it, as Ruth Simmons said, every day. But most white Americans, almost all of us, know it is wrong. We are ashamed of racism, and that is an enormous change. Brown against Board of Education, moreover, did more than transform American attitudes on race. It had a powerful impact on the outside world. I think it undermined the South African doctrine of apartheid, which was based on the philosophical belief, or at least purported to be, that separating people on racial lines was perfectly just. It takes nothing away from the courage and humanity of Nelson Mandela to say that white, white resistance to his cause of a non-racial South Africa was undermined in part by the Brown decision. Fifty years ago, and more than that, more recently than that, I should say, a culture of fear pervaded much of America's deep south. Today, African Americans can live normal lives in Jackson, Mississippi. They can aspire to leadership in law or politics without having to look in the rearview mirror with anxiety when they drive down a lonely road at night. Brown against Board of Education made possible a revolution. It made possible Michelle Stamps.